I had, uh, this is new, right? So, so the, 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 the round, I'm very close. Hi, Nick, how's it going? Um, very close to each other. Uh, but I was yesterday in a very close quarters environment. Uh, I was at Play Street Museum over in Lake Highlands. Anybody know Play Street? I'm getting some head nods right here, nice. Um, I wasn't there by myself, that would be weird. Um, <laughs> I was, it's, it's like a, a, a museum, not really a museum, it's basically like an indoor playground that has like different like play areas for kids. And so I took the girls over there, I promised them, uh, Kim was, was working yesterday and so I promised them, I'll take you to Play Street tomorrow. And uh, I did not realize that when I told them I would take them at nine o'clock that the men's national team uh, was playing at nine o'clock. But uh, having done this sermon on a good father, I was like, I've got to stick by my promises here. And so uh, while I was there, I met a true American hero. This man was decked out in his U.S. men's team jersey and making the greatest sacrifice, he brought an iPad and he streamed the game. And so it was great. All the dads were like peering at the game and then like, okay, our kids are fine. They're not bleeding. Still looking. Great. And he was a hero. And I can imagine, now this part of the story is fictitious, but I can imagine him coming down the stairs that morning, got his jersey on and his wife is like, honey, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to watch the game. And he's like, no, you're taking the kids to Play Street. They got a birthday party. The unwanted news. And I probably can see his wheels turning and being like, all right, how can I watch the game? How can I be that guy? And I really hope that he's not watching this because you really are my hero. Because um, I was trying to figure out how I was going to do both. And he had the boldness to make a plan and to stick with it. And this is kind of one of the ways we handle unwanted news in our life, right? We make contingency plans. I mean, isn't that what insurance is? Like, we know we're going to run into problems. We know we're going to run into challenges. The Ashtons are one of the, the, the head insurance, right? But even still, there are some things, the, the unwanted news that comes our way that, that you're not prepared for. You don't have a plan. It blindsides you. You think, oh, this would never happen to me. This happens to somebody else. And that's what Joseph encounters in our story this week. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, verses 18 to 25. We're going to jump around a little bit. And we're going to look today at how we respond when unwanted news comes our way and how we respond in a way uh, that, that honors God and really allows his plan to work in our lives. Okay? So we're going to first, we're going to consider. We're going to consider what God is doing. Look at verse 18 of chapter 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit." Now, a wedding is one of the most anticipated social events uh, of our society, right? Birthdays, retirements, those are all things that are anticipated, but nothing is like a wedding. And, and, and being a, a singles minister for so long, I've done a lot of weddings. Uh, it's kind of an occupational hazard. And I know the anticipation that goes into it. And Sam Holm, who used to kind of do what I'm doing right now, um, he always told brides and grooms that it's not, not everything's going to go perfectly, but it'll be a perfect day. And I've seen that in people's marriages and their weddings. And what I've, what I've seen is that, that no matter how much you prepare, and we have a really great uh, preparation here uh, called the Nearly Wed class. They're actually starting uh, a new semester next uh, next month. I think January is when they're starting. And so if you're engaged or looking at getting engaged, you can definitely look at how to get signed up in that. It's a great prep. But no matter how much you prepare or how little you prepare, you're going to encounter some unwanted news. Engagements, something's going to go wrong. But I guarantee you, no matter what goes wrong, for the most part, you're only going to have second place to what goes wrong in Joseph's life, which is when he finds out that the woman he's betrothed to is pregnant. Now, betrothal in that day and age is a little different than engagement. There's some similarities. But a betrothal was a legal engagement. The, the groom went before a court with uh, the bride's family, usually the dad. 
There was an exchange of a dowry, and then he was legally obligated at that point to marry the woman. And the only way out of it was through death or divorce. And essentially, for all intents and purposes, it was a marriage. It was a marriage without the cohabitation and without the consummation of the relationship, which would take place about a year later. And so Joseph's trying to figure out how in the world am I going to address this? How in the world am I going to get around this with minimal blowback to me, minimal blowback to my family, and frankly, minimal blowback to Mary? I don't want her to to suffer any more than I know she's going to have to. And so I kind of picture Joseph, and and maybe you're like this, just kind of sitting around and maybe in his shop, maybe when he's going to lay down to bed at night. And those thoughts just kind of encroach. Remember, he's a, he's, a, he's a craftsman. He's a carpenter. And so when you're doing manual labor that you know what you're doing, uh, I wouldn't know what that's like, but I've heard about it. Like if you're cutting the grass, if, you, if you've cut the grass enough, you can kind of check out while you're mowing the lawn, right? And those thoughts, whatever you're worried about, kind of intrudes on your brain. And, and I just kind of picture him in his shop being like, man, this is not the way I saw this going. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What's the right thing to do here? How can I extricate myself from this? And this is a natural response. This is a natural response. This is how people respond to unwanted news. When something hits you that you don't want to hear, you start mulling it over. You start considering. You start thinking about it. I mean, think about the last time that you got unwanted news. Think about it. How did you respond? Were you anxious? Were you worried? Did you have a panic attack? Thought you were having a heart attack, but it turns out you're just really, really scared. Did you blow up? Some of us, when we get anxious, we get irritable. So we lash out at other people. We lash out the people that aren't necessarily uh, the ones to blame for our anxiety, but we lash out at them anyway. Did you self-destruct? Get into some habits that... Maybe you wish you hadn't, and now you have to deal with them. Did you shut down? Are you now a shell of the person that you once were because of this one bit of unwanted news that came your way, whether it was last week or last year or whatever? Unwanted news can change us. One of the great problems that we have when we're hit with unwanted news is uh, we try to chart out a new course in our life based on the, new, the, the, the unwanted news that we got, and, and we don't have all the facts. So what we have to do is we have to plot a new course while filling in blanks. And we don't know the whole story. We don't understand everything that's going on. We don't perceive uh, all the ideas. So we talk to people. We look at similarities. The internet's great for that, for being like, what did this person do when this happened? How should I respond, Right? And one of the things that we fail to consider in the midst of this is we never really ask ourselves the question, this is unwelcome news to me, but is this unwelcome news to God? Does God find this news unwelcome? Now, I believe that God is sovereign. I believe he's in control. And I believe nothing happens without his say-so, whether it's his Uh, active will, right, where he actively causes things to happen, or his permissive will, where he allows things to happen. I don't think God is the author of sin. I don't think God is the author of evil. But I think he allows things to happen, even bad things to happen, so that he can further his glory and allow us uh, the opportunity to see his redemptive work, right? So what happened to the Ashtons is not a good thing, not at all. But you see how God has redeemed it and worked in spite of the bad that happened. So does God find things unwelcome? I think sometimes he does, yeah. Scripture is very clear that God grieves. He gets sad. That God's heart hurts when we hurt. We don't have time to get into all the theological nuances of that. But you can take comfort in the fact that when you grieve, God grieves with you. God mourns alongside of you. And so we're given in the midst of this some information that Joseph doesn't necessarily have, which is we know that Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So we just kind of skip right over Joseph's tortured, I don't know how long it was, weeks, months, 
We don't know how long it was before in between Mary finding out she was pregnant and Mary's visit by the angel and Joseph's. But we do know that one of the things that makes unwelcome news unwelcome is that it thwarts the plan we have for our life. That's what makes unwelcome news unwelcome, right? I mean, the reason why a terminal cancer diagnosis at 40 is unwelcome news is because most of us have a plan to live as long as we can. That's our goal. It's unwelcome news when your kid comes home and says, I'm dropping out of college because you have a plan that you've been charting for your child since the moment you found out that you were pregnant. That's what unwanted news does. It, it interferes with the goals and the plans that we have. And so when we consider, when we think about this unwanted news that we got, we have got to consider God's plan in the midst of our unwanted news. That has to be a part of our calculus. It has to be a part of the things that we factor in. And maybe the best way to do this is to think about what are our goals? What do we want out of life? What do I want out of life? Some of us want comfort. Some of us want security. One of my biggest goals in life, I'm be honest with y'all, is simplicity. And I don't mean like go live in a tiny house and HGTV simplicity. I mean like whatever is the easiest way to get through my day, whatever the path of least resistance is, let's go right on. And so even when I talk to Kim, when I talk about making plans, we had to adjust some plans we had over Thanksgiving and I had to preface the plans with, honey, I know that my default is to do whatever is easiest. So take this with a grain of salt. It makes it sound like I'm a super coward up here. I don't mean it that way. What is your plan? What is your goal? See, the annoying things about unwanted uh, news is that it knocks aside the lie that our plans and our goals line up exactly with God's plans and God's goals for our lives. You see, when you get that unwanted news, when you find out that thing you didn't want to find out, you begin to have your idols exposed. You begin to find out that thing you've been pursuing all your life maybe wasn't exactly what God had for you. And maybe you've been pursuing the wrong thing, or maybe it's time to pursue a new thing. The other thing was, was the right thing for then, but it's a new thing now. And if you're like me, you're like, eh, I'd rather not have a new thing. I kind of like the old thing because I like comfort. Finding out unwanted news is an opportunity for your goals to become more in line with what God has for your life. And you might ask yourself, well, Travis... What are God's goals for my life? There are three, and they're the same three for everybody. God's goal for you is his glory, so he wants your, his name magnified in your life. Our good, so he really is working for your best, even when it doesn't seem like it, and for you to be shaped more and more into the image of his son. Those are his three goals for your life. And that looks differently for each person, but that is exactly what God wants for you and for me. So how do we get there? What does it take after we consider, after we think about this, what then do we do? Well, we have to be courageous. Look again at verse 20. We have to be courageous. In verse 20, it says, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, at this point, gets the rest of the story. He finds out that Mary really is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He finds out what's going on. And within these first five, uh, sorry, verse two uh, chapters of the book of Matthew, we find out that, that God has been planning this redemptive story for a long time, literally been planning it forever. God has been at work. And Matthew, in the first two chapters, uses five prophecies to show how God has been planning it. We see one here in Isaiah. 
And he tells Joseph, I've been planning this for so long, and I want you to be a part of it, and I want you to take Mary as your wife, and I want you to be the one that names Jesus. Now, this was important. Notice, what does he call him? He calls him Joseph, son of David. We're in the round, y'all. This is interactive. Come on. I'm down on your level right now. Son of David. He says, son of David. Son of David. You're going to adopt Jesus. And in Matthew's gospel, the adoption of Jesus is the way in which Jesus becomes the heir of David and fulfills all those promises. Because in their culture, just like in ours, an adopted child is a full-fledged member of the family. There's no debate as to legitimacy or anything like that. If you adopt it, if the father names the child, guess what? They are just as much your child as someone from your own blood. And so there was no question of legitimacy of Jesus's lineage. He is a son of David, probably by blood on Mary's side, but certainly by adoption through Joseph. And this is the first place that God's plan meets a challenge in the Gospels, because Joseph can do something that all of us would be tempted to do. No. I've got a script in my head. I've got a plan of how things are going to go. I was going to marry a nice girl from Nazareth. I was going to settle down, have a small business where I made small wooden things for people, and it was going to be awesome. And now this is super complicated. I don't like this. And could God have redeemed it? Of course. Were there other descendants of David? Yes. Could God appear to them and said, hey, like Top Gun, first choice is gone. You're up. (laughs) He was like, okay. Yes. But you see, Joseph is given an opportunity here. God does not need Joseph to make the plan work. Joseph is being given an opportunity. The redemptive plan of history is about to take a gigantic leap forward. Probably the highlight, depending on who you talk to, it's either Christmas or Easter, right? Of God's redemptive plan for humanity. And Joseph is not just given a front row seat to watch it happen. He is given an active role in it. It's like going to see an improv show and you're sitting on the front row and the people are like, hey, come up here and be with us. Everybody's like, ah, no, I'm good. (laughs) Joseph is given an active part and he can say yes or he can say no. And this invitation is made to him with the most common command in all of scripture. Anybody knows what it is? Do not be afraid. It is given over 360 times. In fact, David, the original David, tells it to his own son, Solomon, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. If Joseph can master his fear, if he can conquer his fear, replace it with faith, just like TJ talked about last week, he can be a part of God's plan. He can be an active part of it. And I think this is one of the reasons why he calls him son of David. I think he calls him son of David because it's true. I think he calls him son of David because as the readers, we need to see that God's fulfilling a plan. But it's for three, the third reason is because I think the angel is saying, who are you going to be, Joseph? You're going to be podunk carpenter that nobody ever knows. Or are you going to follow in the footsteps of your ancestor who was the greatest king Israel ever had? Are you going to be like your ancestor who fought bears and lions and giants? Are you going to be like your ancestor whose music was literally the words of God? Are you going to be like your ancestor who wrote music that could soothe souls tortured by demons? Are you going to be like your ancestor, the king who stockpiled supplies so the temple of God could be built? Are you going to be like him? Are you going to be a man of courage, a man of faith, or are you going to be ruled I fear. Because above all of this, David was made a promise. In 2 Samuel 7, David has made a promise by God that he will never ever fail to have a man rule on the throne. There's going to be an opportunity, a time when a descendant of David is going to reign forever and ever and ever on the throne of Israel. And be ruler. And Joseph gets an opportunity to be on the front row seat of making that promise a reality. All it takes is a little faith. Maybe a lot of faith in Joseph's case. Because remember what happens. After this, we pretty much don't talk about Joseph anymore. Which means he probably, likely died before Jesus ever started his ministry. 
before Jesus ever went to the cross and before Jesus was ever resurrected, which means Joseph probably died before he saw the prophecies come true, which is interesting because guess what that means for Joseph? It means he is, again is just like David. It's just like Moses, just like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Abraham, Isaac, Ruth, Esther, these people that were made promises and they have to step out in faith. I'm not going to lie to you. Not everything that happens to us will God give you an explanation as to why it took place. Do I think everything has a silver lining? I guess maybe. I feel like that's a kind of a crass way to say it. I believe God is working a redemptive purpose behind everything that he causes or allows to happen in your life. We live in a broken world. But God does not owe you an explanation for why he does what he does in your life. And many of us, I know, because I hear this, it's like, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about this. Guess what? God still probably will say, yeah, I don't have to tell you that. Just because you're glorified doesn't mean I owe you an explanation. He's still God. You're still created. Doesn't mean you can't ask. Just means he doesn't owe you an explanation. But what happens here and what we're exploring, what we remember at Christmas is that, yes, there are bad things that happen. There are awful things that happen. They're all over the news. And the only way we have any kind of hope is if this story about a baby is true. That's what we got. That's what we talk about here at this church. That's what you come here to get every single week. At least I hope that's what you come here to get. Because if you're looking for better marriages, better friendships, better working relationships, whatever it is you're looking for, if it's anything less than the gospel, I'm going to be honest with you. There are people out there, better marriage counselors than me, better career advisors than me. But the gospel is what we have, the truth of Jesus, the hope. That's what we cling to. That's our only hope. We've got to hold on to it. And that takes courage. Because the unwelcome news that Joseph got is the most welcome news in the world to us. The brokenness gets redeemed. The sinners get saved. The enemies become friends and family. Joseph's bad news was good news for everybody else. And so we're called to be courageous. We're called to be courageous people of faith. We've got to trust in God's promises. That's what Joseph is being asked to do here. He can't trust his eyes. He can't trust what a society tells him to do. He could have woken up from that dream and been like, what a crazy dream. I must have been thinking about this way too much because now I'm dreaming about it. No, he does exactly what the angel tells him to do. He believes the prophecies. He trusts the promises of God. And you might sit there and say, Travis, of course he did. Those prophecies were made so close to his time that they were much nearer to him. They, he, it wasn't that hard to believe it. No. Do you know how, what the time difference is between the promise made to David in 2 Samuel 7 and Joseph's life? It's a thousand years. The Isaiah prophecy that's in the passage we just read is 750 years old. The prophecies were ancient to Joseph, just like they're ancient to us. There's not that big of a difference between 1,000 years and 3,000 years. It's still old. Joseph requires just as much faith as we have to trust God in those promises. And look what he does. God is telling you today, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to trust me. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we afraid of? What are we worried about? There's lots to be scared of. The economy is scary. No matter what it does, it's scary. I'm just going to be honest. Maybe that's just me being ignorant. I don't know. But it's up. I'm like, meh. It's down. I'm like, meh. I'm scared. Hold me. <laughs> scared of health concerns. We're scared of all sorts of stuff. But I want to talk to a specific group today that's been given a label. This is Gen Z. You see, Gen Z has been given a label, I read this a couple uh, different places this week, called Generation Fear. And it's not a pejorative term. It doesn't mean like y'all are afraid. It's like you've been terrorized. Because when you were born, 
When you were born, the, the big event was 9-11. Most of you were born right around 9-11. And every tragedy that has befallen humanity since then, every evil, every brokenness that's taken place, guess what? You've had a front row seat to it. For a little screen on your phone, or a screen on your laptop, or your iPad, or whatever on your TV. You have had a front row seat to every single tragedy over the last 22 some odd years. And that's why you're called Generation Fear. Because there's a lot to be scared of. And can I be honest with you? If the gospel's not true, be afraid. You have every right to be afraid. It's a scary place out there. It's a scary, scary world. But if the gospel is true, I don't think you can be Generation Fear. I think you have an opportunity. Just like Joseph was invited in, this generation, Generation Z, can be invited in to be a generation of faith. And I remember, because I'm a millennial, I remember, it feels weird to be like looking back as a millennial, <laughs> just to be honest. But I remember we were said, many, many of the same things were said to us as millennials. I remember we had the song, oh God, let us be a generation that's in it. Y'all remember, I'm not singing anymore, but you remember. <laughs> Han, can I, I got to have a job? Um, I remember thinking like a whole generation of followers of Jesus, that seems unbelievable. And maybe it's not because we have an amazing God that can do amazing things. But if you are a part of Generation Z, maybe it's just you that's going to be the person of faith. I had a thing in my office before I changed offices. Uh, it's from Jonathan Edwards, and it's one of his resolutions. And he says, resolved, I will follow God. And if nobody else does, I still will. Will you be afraid or will you be full of faith? What are you going to do? How do we show that? How do we show that? Well, we have to comply. We have to comply. Look at verse 13 of chapter 2. Uh, we're going to dive out of the story a little bit and skip ahead to verse 13. Now, when they had departed, and this is the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. But when Herod died, this is verse 19, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. And Joseph said again, just kidding, he didn't really, <laughs> saying, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. We don't have to go outside the story that we were just in uh, to see that Joseph is a man who obeys God. But it's important to see that his obedience isn't just a one-time thing. This is a lifestyle of obedience. You don't just agree to adopt a kid and then like, it's easy from there. Those of you who have children know agreeing to have the kid is probably the easy part. But Joseph commits again and again and again. Let's think about how logically this works. When Jesus is born there in Bethlehem, they probably stay there for a couple of years until the wise men show up. So G Joseph starts a business. He's close by to Jerusalem, which is where the temple was. And we'll find out next week that the temple had some contacts with Bethlehem. And so even though it wasn't a large town, Joseph maybe did some work for the temple. Maybe it was just being close to Jerusalem. It wasn't this podunk rural village. It was just like a suburb of Jerusalem. Great. But then he has to pack up 150 miles and go to Egypt, at least 150 miles to Egypt. He gets established again. It's probably about eight, 10 years that they're in Egypt. And then he finds out, I've got to go all the way back again, but I can't go to Bethlehem. I've got to go back to Nazareth, which by the way, Nazareth, which is where I'm from and where Mary's from, everybody there knows that the oldest son of Mary isn't my kid. And when they roll into town, people probably are like, psst, 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 look at that. I didn't say anything there. I just whispered. Some people don't like it if they don't know what I say. I'm just saying. <laughs> you see, Joseph has a lifetime of obedience. That again, let me remind you, culminates in him not seeing the fruition 
He's a man of faith without the payoff. And I know what you're thinking here. You're probably thinking, Travis, you're going to tell me that now I have to consider and then I've got to be courageous and then I've got to comply and it's all going to be great. No. I mean, that's good if you want to take that from here. But as great as Joseph is, as good as Joseph is, as awesome as Joseph is, and he is awesome, he's a titan of the faith. Let me ask you a question. Are you better than Joseph? How's your spiritual relationship with the Lord stack up to the adopted father of the Messiah? Because I feel like I'm a pretty decent dad. In fact, when I was running through this yesterday, my daughter heard me say that, and she was like, you are, which was great. (laughs) I always want my children to tell me that I'm a decent father. Great. (laughs) love that. But I'm not raising Messiah good. I'm not. Remember, Jesus doesn't need Joseph. Anybody could have done the job. Any son of David could have done the job, but Joseph still needs Jesus. Joseph needs his son to die for him, to pay for his sins, so that he can have the relationship with God that he has always wanted, that was promised to him. The son of David, every son of David needs the ultimate son of David to die for them. And everybody else does too. You need Jesus. Unless you're way better than Joseph. And I'm willing to bet not many of us are. The next bit of unwanted news you get might be the last bit of unwanted news you get. Are you ready for that? The next bit of unwanted news you get might be the bit of news that begins the decline of your life. This might be your last Christmas. The next time you see the first Noel, the first Noel you sing next year might be in the presence of the king. Are you ready for that? And if the answer is no, you might be filled with fear right now. And I will tell you what the angel told to Joseph. Do not be afraid. Because there's good news in the midst of that unwelcome news, which is that it's Jesus, the King, and the Messiah came and died to pay for your sins, to pay for mine, so that we don't have to be afraid of our greatest enemy, death, anymore. And so we can look any bit of unwanted news in the eyes, and we can say, you know what? Maybe not bring it on, because I think that sounds a little too macho. But in Christ... Lord Jesus, please rescue me and carry me home. Are you ready to be that courageous? The one who cries out, I can't handle this. I need you, Lord, so that I can follow you with every breath I have for the rest of my life. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, it is good to be with your people today. And Lord, I pray for the next person in this room who gets unwanted news, I pray that your hands would hold them, that your nail-scarred hands would remind them of the great love that the Father has for them, and they would find their comfort and rest in you, and that they would respond as your adopted Father responded, Lord Jesus, and they might trust in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.